Well, it is 8.02 in the a.m., so I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Jomo Stewart uh, here at the Fairbanks Economic Development Corporation. It is Tuesday, December 15th, and uh, we are here for what I believe will be, unless something something major pops up in the next couple of days, our last Energy for All Alaska Task Force meeting of the year. Uh, continuing with our discussions regarding COVID and its impacts uh, on the local as well as statewide economy, uh, we've invited uh, Dr. Machine Gatabi of ICER. He's an associate professor, as you see on the screen, of economics uh, at UAA with the Institute of Social and Economic Research, ICER. Uh, to give us, uh, again, we, we had a, a little bit more of a localized view yesterday um, and a little, a little closer to the ground, i.e. our healthcare system, as well as our small business sector. Uh, and now we're going to go macro. So, Doc, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and hand it over. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, so, yeah, uh, I what I'm going to try to do is, is give a, a fairly broad overview of how uh, COVID-19 has affected the, the Alaska economy. I'll discuss uh, a forecast that I, uh, a macroeconomic forecast that I released towards the end of July. Uh, and I'll talk, if we have time, about the, the budget that the, uh, the governor just released a couple of days ago and how that potentially interacts with the state of the economy. Um, and uh, Jomo mentioned this, uh, but feel free to interrupt. Uh, I, it shows that I have 41 slides, but I, I, I very, unlikely, very unlikely that I will go through all of them. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I don't know what the typical format is for interrupting, but, but feel free to do so. So really the, the, the structure is fairly straightforward. I'll walk you through uh, obviously oil prices production, just tell you a little bit about how that sector has been affected. Um, uh, there is one of one of the nice things that's happened. There haven't been many nice things in 2020, but one of the nice things that's happened in terms of, of uh, uh, doing economic analysis is, is there's been a, a, a very large number of new data sets that are using real time information to help us gauge what's going on in the economy. I'll plug uh, uh, trackTheRecovery.org, which I'm assuming many of you are, are familiar with, but it's a phenomenal website that gives you basically in real time what's happened to spending, what's happened to uh, uh, employment, and um, uh, what's happened to employment and what's happened to unemployment uh, uh, claim insurance. Uh, and so I'll discuss how spending levels have been affected, uh, the extent to which that's uh, 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 normalized now, and what we potentially can do in order to get back on track. Um, unemployment insurance is a series that typically gets ignored. Uh, we never really talk very much about unemployment insurance because those numbers come out on a weekly basis, but it's a fairly boring series. Uh, that we really do not pay that much attention to. But as a result of the pandemic, we saw a very significant rise in those numbers. And they're really the, the, the most timely uh, slash important uh, signal of the health of the economy, meaning it tells us how many Alaskans are being laid off and therefore filing for unemployment insurance or how many people are continuing to receive claims. And so that to me, is arguably the most sensitive metric to policies that are implemented both at the state and the national level and the extent to which businesses are starting to recover and therefore uh, take people back on. And then I'll tell you a little bit about my forecast. Like I said, I make quite a few assumptions. Uh, I, I, I do econometric, uh, econometric forecasts on a regular basis, uh, but this, this was an incredibly challenging one uh, because the level of uncertainty is so high. We know that the tourism industry was devastated. We know that uh, uh, futures prices in oil reached negative territory. So making assumptions about uh, the future feels like a fool's errand. But uh, at least for me, when I conduct economic forecasts, what I try to do is say, uh, here are some assumptions. Uh, and under those assumptions, this is the most likely path forward and that that's how I think about them and I think about them as potentially uh, uh, useful in setting policy uh, and like I said uh, 
the, the state of Alaska has been running a deficit for multiple years. There are questions about the extent to which the government should be uh, stabilizing economic activity and how much we should be spending or overspending from the permanent fund, uh, whether or not we should wait for the federal government to interfere and provide additional unemployment insurance. And so uh, if we do get time, I'll walk you through uh, what I think I understand about the budget. It's only been released a couple of days ago and how that potentially interacts back uh, with, the, with the state of, of, of COVID. Um, so I'll share the presentation with Jomo. Uh, most things that are in blue in the presentations are linked that take you to the original document. So this is the forecast. It's a hundred page document. So if you'd rather read that, please feel free to click on this and, and go through it. So uh, th this is essentially uh, uh, my, my page of telling you all the bad things that, that have happened since March. Uh, uh, and I'll go through them in detail, but as I've said, uh, unemployment insurance claims at the state level typically average about 900 per week. Um, since March 21st, we've been averaging about 6,500. Uh, uh, over the last couple of weeks, we're right around 5,000 per week. So unemployment insurance claims, these are initial filings. These are people that are newly filing to receive unemployment insurance. Uh, and I'm using here claimants and number of claims interchangeably, even though those two things may not necessarily be the same. But uh, again, to give you a sense of the scale of the crisis, uh, we are, again, as of December 5th, are almost 5,000 initial claims. We typically average about 9,000. So conservatively, we have five times the number of initial claims being filed on any given week, which is obviously very, very elevated. Uh, uh, it's, it's gone down uh, markedly since March and April and May, but we're still running five times the typical level. So, so uh, my, my takeaway, and I'll, I'll kind of uh, uh, tell you where I think the economy is going before going into the details, I think that we, we've reached bottom, meaning I don't anticipate that we'll get back to uh, April, May type uh, uh, numbers in terms of unemployment. However, uh, 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 you all know this probably better than I, there aren't that many catalysts that point towards a robust recovery. And so we've kind of plateaued in terms of the recovery and we've now been running close to 27, 28,000 uh, uh, overall claims, meaning that's continuing claims, regular claims. Uh, we have POA, pandemic unemployment assistance at about 10,000. And then we're getting these five, about 5,000 weekly claims. Um, and so uh, uh, the, the question is, uh, how do we get back to normal? Uh, I think uh, obviously there needs to be some sort of secondary uh, 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 package from the federal government and to the extent the state could step uh, step up and, and help, I think that's going to be necessary because again, uh, it's very hard to imagine that we're going to just shed uh, all of these unemployment insurance claims naturally uh, because you have to ask yourself, where is the demand going to come from? What's the sector that's going to uh, push the economy forward? And when, and I'll show you this, when you go through the economy, what you see is a sea of red in terms of uh, employment gains, or in this case, employment losses. Um, so uh, these are the most recent numbers. As I said, initial claims are newly filed claims. So this is December 5th at the state level, 4821. This is from the BLS. Uh, continuing claims are almost 20,000. So these are people that filed previously and continuing to receive claims. And then we have PUA claims. These are gig worker claims, right? So as a result of the pandemic, uh, uh, we, we now have gig workers that are also receiving unemployment insurance. And so uh, those are uh, almost 11,000. As you all know, we're in, we're on, today is December 15th. At the end of December, many, many of these programs uh, that have been stood up in order to help uh, uh, workers affected by the pandemic are expiring. So there are big, big question marks. Um, I don't want to call it an, an income cliff because we've already had one of those in July, but we have basically a benefit cliff that's coming up here uh, uh, in, in July. Uh, 
Hey, Dr. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Tabi. Yeah. Just one moment. Hey, uh, Mr. Bringhurst, I see you come here off mute. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. Thanks. Carry on, Doc. Sure. So, so one of the, the metrics that I get emails about and people say, look, the unemployment rate has dropped a lot. I'm not sure why you think that the economy is not as strong as it is. It was 12.7% in May. It's already dropped to 59 in October. This is a, a seasonally adjusted unemployment rate at the state level. Um, the, the, the tricky thing, and I say this quite a bit, I, I'm not a huge fan of the unemployment rate as a metric of the health of an economy because the unemployment rate is made up of people in the labor force. Uh, uh, and so uh, when the, the labor force drops, it puts downward pressure on the unemployment rate and it makes it look as though the economy has improved. And so that's partially what's happening here. We've had people drop out of the labor force. Uh, that's not typically a sign of economic strength. Um, and as a result of that decline in the labor force, what that's doing is that it's pushing the unemployment rate down and it's making it look like the economy has recovered a lot more than it actually has. So uh, uh, my, my caveat is the unemployment rate dropping uh, without looking under the hood is a really good thing. We need to see how much of that drop is truly due to people going from being unemployed to being employed and how much of it is due to people actually dropping out of the labor force, meaning uh, no, no longer looking for a job because they're discouraged or they don't want to get infected or they're, they're worried and they're just sitting at home. And so uh, what we're seeing in the data is that a, a non-negligible portion of the drop in the unemployment rate is actually due to uh, 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 um, uh, declines in the labor force. And then consumer spending, and this is the data series that I mentioned. So if you go to trackthecovery.org, uh, you can see this. The, the, there is this uh, newly uh, uh, put together website. It's a, a collaboration between Harvard and Brown and a couple of, of uh, 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 big uh, credit card and debit card processors that basically uh, provides spending data uh, by state, by sector. Uh, you can even get some county specific data um, that, that gets updated on a weekly basis. And as of the most recent week, and, and the most recent data is fairly noisy, uh, 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 consumer spending is still down relative to January levels. Now, consumer spending is important because obviously that reflects whether you or I are spending money at restaurants or bars or going out or doing the things that we typically do. And we know that, that many businesses are struggling largely because of this massive decline in consumer spending. And so we, not only did we not have the summer season that we're accustomed to, but, but uh, uh, consumer spending by people that actually reside in Alaska has been down and continues to be down. Now, that could be due to closures, that could be due to people uh, 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 changing their patterns of behavior. Uh, it could be due to the fact that there are so many people that are unemployed and they don't have the resources necessary to actually spend. Uh, I, I don't wanna spend too much time on this, but, but one thing I really want to communicate and I've been trying to do in, in, in all the talks that I've given is say that as bad, so I've just painted a fairly grim picture at 8.05 a.m. Uh, but one thing I do want to mention is as bad as things are, they could have been so much worse. Why do I say that? Because the scale of the federal aid was just absolutely gigantic. And what you're seeing before you here is personal income data that comes out of the Bureau of Economic Analysis for uh, 2020, quarter one and, and, and uh, first and second quarter. And we've had a jobs crisis. We have not had a personal income crisis at the aggregate level. So if I tell you that personal income actually increased in Q2 relative to Q1, you would think I was lying, but personal income actually did increase because of the significant amount of money that's been transferred from the federal government to the state government or to state residents, meaning that absent this federal aid. And so just so that we're clear, this is showing that the overall amount of transfer receipts uh, uh, on aggregate increased between Q2 and Q1 by almost $5 billion. And net earnings declined by a, a, a little more than $2 billion, which means that net 
personal income actually increased by two and a half billion dollars. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody's balance sheet is doing well or that households are not struggling, but it means on aggregate, there's been considerable amount of relief money that has kept people's uh, balance sheets, for the most part, at least uh, uh, stable uh, uh, for the time being. And so absent this aid, we would have been looking at a very different economy. We would have looked, we would have been looking at considerably different spending levels. And that matters because this is one of the reasons why just about every economist or every person that follows policy has been talking about the need for continued aid because everybody understands that the floor of economic activity has been raised quite substantially in no small part due to this assistance. And if you remove it all of a sudden, then it shows quite a few cracks that are being hidden under the surface. And that's really the concern right now for me is, as I've said, uh, I think economic activity, uh, uh, I think we've hit bottom, but the, the things that we don't quite understand very well, and maybe some of you do, and, 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 and if you do, please feel free to share, is that we've had, uh, for example, moratoriums on evictions. We've had moratoriums on foreclosures. We've had significant federal aid. And all of those things have been uh, uh, really useful in stabilizing economic activity. Uh, and so we only see uh, uh, the numbers that we do see in conjunction with all of this aid. And so I don't wanna say that the economy is artificially good, uh, but it's being propped up by many, many programs uh, and, and the elimination of that aid could potentially present a lot of different challenges. And that's why there's been this chorus of calls, irrespective of how people view government or assistance or uh, uh, um, uh, transfers, there's been this uh, uh, unanimous or near unanimous call for, for additional aid because of the understanding that the economy, whether at the state level or at the national level, would have been much, much worse absent this aid, and that income levels have actually, again, at the aggregate level, this does not mean that there aren't people that are really struggling, because there are, and there are thousands of them, but at the aggregate level, at least, uh, um, the initial round of relief was really, really successful. So uh, I'm going to pivot to the... the, the uh, to, to, to sectors, uh, uh, Alaska still remains a resource state, right? And so, uh, but uh, the, the, the relative importance of, of oil and gas, I guess is a big question mark going forward. We know that we've hit futures, uh, uh, oil, uh, oil futures hit negative territory, as you can see in April, uh, what you're seeing here is oil prices in 20, 2019, and I don't know which color you see this, either it's uh, dark blue or, or black, and then the light blue is 2020. And as you can see, we basically had this period of three or four months where prices drop to, again, uh, basically zero, and they've stabilized over the last four months, but there is still this $20 gap essentially between 2019 and 2020 levels um, that just hasn't gone away. Uh, one thing that's happened, and this is uh, uh, what's interesting in these markets, is you see this coordinated response to the Pfizer vaccine um, and you see this uh, straight line increase in oil price. So these are daily oil prices that go up until what's today, the 15th, that go all the way up until uh, last Friday or yesterday. Uh, and so we, we've seen this very significant response, uh, uh, significant, going from 40 to 45 um, to, to the, the vaccine, but we're still running below 2019 levels. So the question really is, uh, yes, oil prices have stabilized. Uh, the, we, we, we've kind of established this $40 uh, 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 low, and we've been there for, for a few months. Uh, uh, the, the, the improvement in global economic activity uh, seems to have translated into increases in prices. Um, but remember that in 2019, we were talking about $60 oil prices as not being sufficient to balance the budget as not being high enough to make certain projects attractive. So uh, I guess it's, it's thank God for $40 oil prices, but they're not high enough as last year. And last year's prices were not high enough uh, uh, to get us to uh, uh, 
do everything we need to do in order to balance economic activity. And then uh, the production Dr. Dr. is actually Dr. a lot messier. Um, hey, Doc. Yeah, gotta, sorry. Uh, yes, Rep. Hopkins. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gattabi. I have a quick question about the, the um, consumer spending slide that you had. Sure. I apologize for missing that one. No, you when fine. And maybe you'll touch on this later so you can ignore this question now, but the uh, when the $1,200 boost and the $1,000 PFD came out in uh, the summer, did you see a corresponding boost in consumer spending and, and a boost in the economy as well? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, uh, that's, so we... we because of the, 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 the scale of the shock uh, to the economy, we have not been able to isolate the true effect of the PFD in the midst of the pandemic right now, right? So we, we've previously done work specifically isolating the effect of the PFD. Uh, we did not try, I did not try to estimate the effect of the PFD this time around. And, and I'll tell you why quickly. It's because obviously there were uh, uh, many closures that were still ongoing, meaning that the, the typical spending patterns were not at play, right? And so people were not going to restaurants. People, so they may have been paying back uh, uh, rent mm -hmm. or, or paying overdue bills, but that's very hard to estimate from, from a pure economic standpoint, right? And so meaning that uh, the money may have been going into the landlord's uh, checking account, uh, but that's not necessarily being spent at the grocer or at the restaurant. And so uh, it was a challenging year to truly identify uh, the, the economic impact of an additional dollar in the PFD or in the stimulus payments. Um, so so there, there has been work at the national level that has tried to tease out the effect of the stimulus payments. Um, it, it's not causal exactly, but there has been work that's tried to tease that out. At the state level, like I said, I, I don't feel comfortable saying this is the true effect of the PFD because the marginal propensity to consume or the portion of a dollar in PFDs that made it into the economy in July is not reflective of true spending levels, given that we were all hunkered down and we were not uh, undertaking the normal uh, spending patterns that we typically do. So, uh, and I'll show you a, a spending slide here in a second. And I have a lot more spending than I'm, than, than I'm gonna talk about, but I'm happy to share it later. Um, so, so production levels, as I've said, have held up okay. Um, we, we're right around that 500,000 barrels per day. Uh, uh, and, and that's perhaps a little surprising. Uh, and this is noisy purposely so, just to show you what's happened to, so again, 2020 is, is the, the, the light blue, and you see this decline in production that happened right around the, the, the April, May period, and then you see this stabilization here, and so uh, you see overlap, right, and so between the two years, uh, as of the last week that we have data for, we were right around 498,000 barrels per day, just about. Um, and so it seems as though we're, even though we're still running about $20 short of last year's levels, production levels at least seem to have stabilized. Now, of course, there is uncertainty going forward and, and the extent to which uh, uh, production is going to respond to some of the new projects and some of the, the, the new explorations and potentially a normalization of, of, of oil prices if this global coordinated recovery were to continue uh, is, is a question mark. Now, the, the thing that's concerning, and, and this is kind of a, a statement slash a comment, is even though we've seen oil prices recover, even though, uh, recover, recover to a certain extent, even though we've seen production essentially hold uh, uh, to that 500,000 level, oil and gas employment has just been absolutely shattered. Uh, and so uh, what you see here is the monthly uh, data at the state level, oil and gas employment. And so as of October, the last month for which we have complete data, so the November data comes out this upcoming Friday, so three days from now. Um, but as of October, we're running 3,000 jobs below 2019 levels in oil and gas. And so there, there's been no indication as of yet that the quote unquote normalization in prices or the, uh, uh, the, the steady production levels have translated into rehiring or into job creation in oil and gas. Now that may be just lagging and, and hopefully that's the case, uh, 
in it, typically what we've seen in previous recessions is that job creation or job reattachment or rehire uh, takes a while after prices uh, uh, recover, meaning that you don't just turn the faucet on and you have thousands and thousands of jobs being created. It typically takes quite a while for uh, uh, these oil and gas jobs to come back. Um, I don't know if 6,800 is the new normal. I don't know. Uh, these are questions that are very specific to oil and gas companies, and I, I, I'm not privy to their plans. Um, but what I can tell you is that, uh, as you can see, we were at more than 10,000 jobs in March, and we're at 6,800 right now. And, and for reference, in 2014, the sector had almost 15,000 jobs. So we're, we're a little bit more than a third. So oil and gas in terms of direct employment is a little more than a third of the size it was at in 2014, 20, early 2015. Uh, and, and clearly that has implications that go well beyond the sector itself. And, and a lot of people say this, but the health of the sector obviously translates into these indirect and induced effects that we talk about a lot. And obviously the, the, the jobs are typically fairly high paying. Um, and so I, I, I have a hard time based on the data that I have, based on the information that I have access to, I have a hard time seeing uh, any sort of V-shaped recovery in the sector. There are projects that, are, that seem to be uh, 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 promising, but uh, how we're going to make up this 3,000 job gap uh, is something that, in, in my opinion, is not going to happen overnight. And in my forecast, I don't have the sector recovering or getting back to pre-pandemic levels till well uh, after 2022. Uh, but I hope I'm wrong. So, Doc, before you move on, yeah, this may be outside. It probably is outside the scope of your analysis. Um, but again, there's if you go to the last slide before this one, there's a downward blip in the third quarter for production of 2019. You have downward trend on employment uh, on yeah. the next slide, even though you have stable production starting in, say, April. Does yeah. any of this correlate with the shift of the BP Hillcorp sale? Uh, we, we, we certainly did see declines in oil and gas employment uh, that coincided with the, the, I'll call them layoffs, but, but with, the, with the transition from BP to, to Hillcorp. Uh, uh, I don't think that the, the 3,000 job decrease is reflective of just that, obviously, right? And so, because because the decline here coincides with uh, the pandemic, with the drop in oil prices, uh, uh, and with the tensions between uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia. So, so you're absolutely right, and and I'm not attributing every single job decline from this year to last year to the pandemic. Clearly, we've had a very significant shift in in the sector. And that's certainly still playing out, right? And so we don't know what the, the final count of employment at Hillcorp is going to be and what that mix is. Um, but, but, but I think that uh, I would say this, uh, a significant portion of this job decline is due to the pandemic, at least right now. Uh, uh, that does not mean that we did not see layoffs when the announcements were made and people were, were taking jobs elsewhere. Uh, but but, but I, would, I would say that, uh, um, Again, not attribution, not causality, but, but it, it seems fairly apparent uh, that the declines are due to, to the pandemic and pandemic-related drops in, in prices. Thank you. So, uh, and I'll go through this stuff really quickly, but, but I just, I, I think that this is important because I, I, I get asked a lot this question about where, where do Alaskans spend money and why does this, this, this decline in in spending result in, in declines in economic activity. This is again uh, from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. This is Alaska specific data. And this is a decomposition of where personal consumption goes. Um, and uh, uh, this is the component that we've seen devastated, right? And so when we've seen declines here, so this shows you just to be clear, the portion of personal consumption by category. 
Uh, and so we spend almost 23% of our personal consumption on healthcare. That's much higher than the national average. We spend another 17 and a half or 18% on housing. And then we spend about 8% on outside food. That's takeout, that's food that's prepared outside the house. That's how it's defined. And so obviously this portion here is the one that's declined quite considerably. And we know that <coughs> This has, result, this has translated into revenues of small businesses being decimated. We also know that healthcare, a sector that's been very stable and one that the Alaska economy has mixed feelings about, but we saw a massive decline in healthcare spending right around the start of the pandemic. That sector has stabilized quite a bit now that a, a, a lot of elective surgeries, a lot of elective procedures are back online. But <clears throat> we essentially saw uh, uh, this outside food component uh, uh, go to zero or near zero for a couple of months when we had those, those lockdowns and people were hunkering down. Uh, and then we saw uh, uh, discretionary spending also decline quite a bit. So, so the question now is, uh, how do we get back to normalized levels, if you will, of spending? And that's why I keep coming back to this question of what are the catalysts? How do we get back those 27, 28,000 Alaskans back to work? How do we get an economy that's healthy both financially and obviously uh, from, from a, 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 a virus perspective under control? Because again, absent normalization of behavior, which is achieved by virus containment, a lot of these spending patterns are just not gonna normalize. Uh, and I don't know how Doc. well you can see this. Hey, Doc. Uh, yes. Before you move on, uh, we do have a question. Sure. Thanks, Jomo. Um, doctor, uh, two slides back. I apologize. I'm, no, no, you're uh, fine. Slow in the chat box here. This one here. Was, or... Yep, perfect. I was curious about um, any sense of uh, these numbers in relation to state residents versus out of state. Yeah. So, so we do have. Uh, uh, because of the PFD, we have a LARI, uh, 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 the LARI data set that uh, the that, uh, Department of Labor keeps, uh, which gives you uh, uh, the number of employees by, uh, by sector who are resident, meaning they link employment records to PFD records. And that's incredibly useful. So we know, and, and, they, and they release a, 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 a report every year showing residency by sector. Uh, uh, and so that gives us a very good sense of this. Uh, now, this data specifically uh, uh, has both of them within it. I mean, it okay. has both residents and non-residents within it. Uh, typically, the sector runs at about 30% um, non-resident or so uh, uh, on, 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 an, on an annual basis. Uh, I don't know what the portion of, uh, what portion of the layoffs Mm -hmm. uh, were resident or non-resident, and that's an incredibly important question, right? And so, okay. and, and that's what you're getting at. But but we don't have that data does not come out contemporaneously, um, and so and so we don't know the the residency of the layoffs or on whom has the burden fallen from these yeah. uh, uh, layoffs. And so, uh, clearly, an important question. My guess is, Department of Labor does have the data. Uh, uh, it's not something. It's not a series that they release. But my guess is, uh, uh, with a little bit of work, we can know uh, fairly easily what portion of these three thousand jobs uh, 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 is 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 resident. Um, but but we don't right now. Uh, I mean, you, you, you can triangulate it and say, if you assume that seventy percent of the workforce is resident, and you apply that seventy percent to the three thousand jobs lost. Then, then you get the 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 that uh, uh, one thousand of the jobs or or close to one thousand of the jobs are 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 residents, but but I but I don't know uh, uh, the exact number, but but that's but that's clearly an important question. Well, one well, thing then, that I will and I will plug, we just finished a, a, a paper, a colleague uh, and I, on this, and what we find is, and I, I don't know the extent to which it applies to your question directly, but we tested a question on the North Slope and we asked what happens to employment in the North Slope, resident employment in the North Slope when oil prices increase quite substantially 
um, and we use 2006 as, as a case study. And we find that when oil prices increase substantially, the vast majority of job increases end up going to non-residents. Uh, and so I don't know if that's the case on the, on the, on the downside uh, as well, uh, but, but at least it does appear uh, uh, in our analysis that when there are increases in prices and uh, uh, companies need to increase employment substantially, uh, whether it's because of preparedness or skill or ease of hiring or whatever it is, the vast majority of job gains go to non-residents. And here, non-residents, again, are defined as people who are not linked to the PFD data set. And so that's how uh, okay. uh, that's okay. defined in, in the data. But yeah, Thank you. So, yeah, of course. Um, is, that, is that the kind of information or, or the release of data? say from Department of Labor. I, I expect that com that question is gonna come back up uh, during the legislative session. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to answer it by then? Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly, I, I, I think, like I said, I think that we probably already have that data. Again, it's, it's not out uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's certainly data that, that we should know. Uh, I, I, I know that, that the Department of Labor, I mean, obviously it, it produces the, the trends report and I reach out to them and they're incredibly cooperative. I mean, we have a phenomenal group at, at Department of Labor. And so uh, it's certainly, I, I, I think I should reach out and ask because I'm sure that they have it. And so I probably should make myself a note and, and see if they have uh, uh, th those numbers. Uh, I've tried not to burden them with too many questions because I have a lot of them, but, uh, um, but yeah, I, I think that that's a good point. Um, this is, uh, uh, again, I don't know, I, I, I get I get a lot of questions about how how different is Alaska uh, or, or or how should we think about this crisis in terms of uh, uh, the, the the structure of the Alaska economy and this gives you a sense again what this is doing it's taking these numbers or these proportions and putting them in Alaska and every other state and and really I'll point you to a couple of things which you all know we spend considerably more on healthcare. Um, and that's not surprising to anybody. Um, and we spend a little bit more on outside food, uh, but the rest of the, I mean, uh, when you look across states, one of the reasons why uh, the pandemic has devastated just about every economy is that the decomposition of spending really does not look terribly dissimilar across the country. Uh, and, and what we've seen, we've seen these declines in economic activity just about everywhere, right? Especially around that March period when we had significant fear attached to the virus. Uh, we had uh, uh, closures uh, that were mandated as a result of the, the start of the pandemic. And again, the reason I keep uh, uh, coming back to spending is because at the end of the day, unless there is virus containment and unless there is a normalization of spending patterns, and you're not gonna get any of that uh, uh, unless there are people working and people are feeling fairly secure about uh, uh, their jobs and about their pocketbooks, then uh, uh, the economy is gonna struggle. Um, and so this is a, a series that's ugly on purpose uh, this is data that I uh, uh, scrape from tracktherecovery.org, and I've mentioned it before. It's, I, I think it's been an invaluable uh, 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 resource for me because it allows me to kind of think through what's happening. It's fairly noisy, uh, and I'll explain what we're looking at here. This is spending levels. Uh, this is consumer spending uh, uh, in every state. Uh, the blue line is Alaska. Uh, the gray lines are every other state in the country. And what you see here is spending levels relative to January. And so uh, uh, what you can see is very clearly, and this is what I was saying by declines in economic activity essentially throughout the country. So uh, uh, again, this is pegged to January. And so what we see is we see the bottom fell off in March. And then we're seeing this very slow, uh, uh, recovery, uh, but as of uh, uh, the end of October, uh, we are still well below January levels. And as we all know, in Alaska during the summer, what we typically see is this massive bump 
in consumer spending, in employment. Uh, July employment is typically about 15% higher than it is in January. Spending is similarly much higher in the summer than it is in, in January. And in this series, it's inverted, right? And so uh, as you can see, the blue line here reflect in Alaska shows you that consumer spending fell. It was much lower in the summer than it was in January. Uh, because we basically had no tourism, we've had a much smaller construction season, and it still has not gotten back uh, uh, to pre-pandemic levels. And that's the case basically in, in a number of, of different states. Uh, uh, there, there is variation across places, um, uh, but again, because we rely on that boost in economic activity over the summer, and that did not happen, we now find ourselves in this place where there is, again, a lot of uncertainty about this continued aid we've had. And, and, and again, let me come back to the point I made earlier. As ugly as this series looks, this series would have been so much worse had it not been for the five and a half billion dollars of federal monies that came to the state, right? And so, uh, uh, so this is consumer spending, even with considerable assistance, even with considerable programs that have kind of kept economic activity uh, uh, doing okay. Uh, this is a series that's basically, so the nice thing about the, the data that I mentioned, you can decompose it by sector. And I don't wanna harp on this because these are fairly noisy series. And to be clear, this is anonymized credit card and debit card spending that's taking place in uh, Alaskan zip codes. Uh, and so uh, this is real data. Uh, that's taking place in Alaska. Uh, uh, but it, it again, if you look at entertainment and recreation, uh, as of the, the most recent few weeks, we're still basically at half where we were in January. And that's reflected in the employment data, right? And so we know that uh, uh, employment in leisure and hospitality has been devastated. And I can show you those numbers here in a second. Um, so it should not be terribly surprising that spending uh, has remained weak in the sector. We did not see the bump we typically see over the summer. We're obviously seeing that people are voting with their pocketbooks and staying at home and not aggregating whether or not uh, shops are open or not. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pivot. I know I'm, I'm running short on time, but I'm going to pivot to the unemployment insurance picture and, and this probably, I mean, I could have just talked about this one slide for 30 minutes, but I think it gives you a sense of, again, the scale of the crisis. So these are uh, initial claims, right? And so think about these as filings or first time filings uh, by people that have been uh, just laid off. And these are claims that are initiating uh, uh, the receipt of, uh, uh, of this money. And again, really, really boring series up until March, right? And so the number of people that filed for claims on any given week, if you look at historical data, does not move that much. Uh, uh, and then we saw this absolute explosion in claims, almost reached 15,000, and it's been declining ever since. The concern that I've had, and, and somebody asked earlier about, uh, I, I think it was, it was uh, 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 Representative Hopkins about the, uh, uh, the, the decline or the, uh, 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 the, the expiration of the, the, the benefits. And as you can see, we basically we're reaching a, a trough of sorts in terms of unemployment insurance claims. And then for the last month and a half or two months, we've again started seeing this increase in initial claims, which means that layoffs are starting to increase again. My explanation for this, and, and again, none of this is causal, is that we had PPP loans, we had significant aid that went to businesses, that aid was partially used in order to rehire employees with the hopes that demand was going to come back. And so uh, uh, federal government gave money. Uh, the money was used in order to rehire workers. Uh, clearly, the amount of money needed in order to keep workers on the rolls is dependent on demand coming back. And what we're seeing is that demand is sputtering. Uh, or it has not come back to the levels it was supposed to. And so it's either that 
uh, uh, we're seeing real layoffs or new rounds of layoffs because demand never came back. PPP has expired. And uh, uh, now we're in this very uncertain time about uh, will there be organic growth uh, or do we need uh, additional aid? And I've kind of explained where I think the economy is and the fact that it does need uh, uh, additional aid. Uh, 5.9 federal shot in the arm VA, and multiply that by 49. How is the federal government going to support all this spending if employment is down and tax revenues? Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> um, and how can we afford not to be able to, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question, if I'm understanding it correctly, is saying, uh, how is the government, uh, how is the federal government gonna support, uh, gonna support all of this spending? Um, so I, I'm assuming the question is hinting at concerns about debt or deficit uh, or, uh, uh, the, the wisdom in overspending. Um, this may be surprising, but the economic consensus is coming to a place where it's basically saying, let's ignore the debt and let's ignore the deficit right now. Interest rates are near zero. Uh, uh, foreign governments are throwing money at the US uh, for stability. Uh, access to cash is really, really cheap. Um, not to dismiss concerns about balancing the budget or to dismiss concerns about uh, 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 fiscal responsibility. But if you were to weigh uh, concerns about uh, 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 the calamity that's been caused uh, uh, by the pandemic and concerns about long-term deficit, uh, I would put uh, uh, addressing the pandemic as the much more important goal, meaning, as serious as it is to have a, a, a very high level of debt in the future, I think, uh, I think the situation would be much grimmer if there isn't considerably more uh, support right now. So you're asking where will employment and tax revenues come? I mean, the idea, the very simple idea is if we do help the economy uh, to get back to organic growth, because this is obviously to me, we, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's just that the tunnel is still fairly long, right? And so we, we're six months away uh, by most measures from, from complete inoculation and from people getting back to normal. So, so can we build a bridge between now and the end of next summer and make sure that we don't deal with long-term repercussions? Uh, the, the concern that I've had for Alaska specifically is I would much rather deal with fixing uh, uh, or, or with helping people that are unemployed than deal with foreclosures and deal with homelessness and deal with structural long-term issues if we don't step in over the next few months. Because, it, it, and, and this has been shown over and over, it's much easier to deal with the crisis while the crisis is happening than to deal with the long-term consequences from the crisis. Uh, because uh, uh, dealing with long-term unemployment is much, much harder than dealing with people that have been unemployed for two months, right? And so getting people back to work that have been off the, the labor force for two years is incredibly challenging and is incredibly costly. Uh, so I'm, I'm not suggesting that this is easy, uh, but given where interest rates are, uh, given uh, uh, the fact that we have two highly uh, uh, efficacious vaccines, it does appear uh, uh, that, that it is in the best interest of the economy uh, to actually provide more support right now, rather than start worrying about uh, 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 fiscal discipline. And again, I'm not dismissing that concern, but I'm saying that it seems to be the wrong time uh, to focus on fiscal discipline when there are still millions of people that are unemployed and uh, the cost associated with that unemployment uh, could really have negative consequences on the economy in the long run. So uh, no easy choices, but I think in this case, at least based on the data that I've, that I've seen, both at the state and the national level, it's gonna be really hard uh, for organic growth to get us out of this mess, uh, at least right now. Um, so that's what that's my my long winded answer to that question. Um, 
This is just, uh, th these are unemployment insurance claims by month. And again, this is Department of Labor data. And as you can see, things were very bad in May, much better in October, but still really scary. This is the, uh, this is, this has within it both the regular uh, unemployment insurance as well as uh, uh, the POA, uh, that's the pandemic unemployment assistance. And again, these are the gig workers for whom aid is just gonna disappear essentially in two weeks. Um, and so you, you have a, a fairly big chunk of these unemployed individuals uh, for whom aid is, is ending. Um, this is unemployment insurance claims by borrow. Uh, and surprising, so this is just taking the overall claims. This is October data. This is just taking the overall claims and distributing them uh, 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 by, by area. Um, uh, and so uh, you can see that, uh, and surprising, the largest places have the largest number of claims. This obviously does not mean that that's where the pain is concentrated. It's just in absolute numbers. Uh, the concentration is in places that are very, very dependent uh, or that, that are very large. In terms of pain, uh, the places that are struggling the most are clearly the places that uh, uh, have uh, uh, economies that depend on tourism, that depend on oil and gas, that depend on the hardest hit sectors. Uh, and uh, that, that's not surprising. And that's one of the reasons why uh, I think that in thinking about secondary or tertiary uh, rounds, of aid, uh, rounds of aid or thinking about Alaska specific aid, it may be prudent uh, to allocate dollars based on need, based on economic structure, based on the, the level of the unemployment rate, uh, rather than just kind of uh, 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 evenly distribute uh, uh, resources. Uh, and, and, and somebody again asked about the stimulus. And I think this is a really telling uh, 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 graph in my opinion. So, so as you all know, we had a, a fairly generous unemployment insurance aid for a few months uh, because uh, unemployed people were receiving uh, state unemployment plus the federal boost. And so this shows you how much in unemployment insurance payments in aggregate people were getting. So we've had two things happen. Yes, we've had uh, uh, unemployment numbers come down, but the other thing that we've had happen is that we've seen uh, uh, the, the expiration of that uh, boost in federal payments. And so the aggregate amount of unemployment insurance payments was only 20 million, uh, as opposed to 108 million in July when people were still receiving uh, uh, those boosted unemployment insurance payments, which means that the average amount that people are receiving has declined quite a bit. Uh, and, and that's, again, gonna be reflected in the decisions that people are making in terms of spending behavior, in terms of contributing to that aggregate spending uh, uh, number. I know it's 8.55 and I've only gone through uh, uh, half of this presentation, but I can stop if there are questions. Uh, Jomo, you tell me what you want me to do. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to kind of just wrap up quickly or stop and, and see if there are questions or comments or thoughts or anything. Um, okay. Can I request that you talk about the, the governor's budget impact that you had mentioned at the beginning? Sure. Yes, that's what I was gonna say. So first of all, Doc, do, do you have to rush off to another I don't. Uh, I, I wanted to respect people's time. And so I, I just, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm okay on time. Okay. And I, I am too. Most, a lot of us, uh, we, we can, we can loiter a little long on these, okay. these presentations. Then, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up this section and I'll skip over to the budget. And uh, if you have questions about anything, so I'm going to skip over my forecast, which you can find on the website and I can send you the link, but I can, I can jump to the, the budget if that's okay with everybody. Well, maybe we can blend the two uh, because okay. it really Sounds is. Good. It really okay. is. It's the budget and how close it gets to whatever you would recommend. Yep. Yep. To helping yep. the economy and. Okay. Those, yeah. S -s Sounds good. So, so uh, I'll wrap up this section and then we can we can go back and forth between uh, you know the, the intersection between the economy and the budget. So, so as I've said, I, I think that this gives us a fairly good sense of the decline in in aid that the, the average unemployed person uh, uh, is getting. 
and and I get this question a lot, and and I think it's important. Uh, but but we we've heard. I'm sure all of you have heard about a K-shaped recovery. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about uh, 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 who's being affected by this crisis. So I took just the unemployment insurance numbers or claims, and I divided them by gender. Uh, and as you can see, the the burden is falling. Uh, uh, differently on males and females, depending on, uh, on the borrow you're looking at, and depending on obviously the industrial structure of many of these places. And so uh, uh, Skagway has a, 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 a female to male ratio that's different than that of Anchorage. And so this is showing you the share of claimants uh, uh, who are females uh, by borrow. And, and again, in some places it's as high as 60%. And in, uh, uh, in for example, Aleutians West, it's, it's 40%. Now, of course, this, this has implications um, about spending, about all sorts of things. And so I think it's, it's one of these dimensions that we don't think about a lot, uh, but it's worthy of, 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 uh, of uh, at least uh, um, uh, thinking about. And, and this is all data, again, that the Department of Labor released, I think, a couple of weeks ago. And so I just went through it. It's on their uh, uh, unemployment insurance uh, uh, claims tab. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to skip this because clearly we don't have a V. Uh, we are probably more in a, in a K format right now. Uh, uh, but but I, I always say that the K in Alaska, yes, it's high income, low income. Uh, yes, it's people that have been fortunate enough to work from home versus people uh, that, that have jobs that require face-to-face -face interaction. But I think that the K in Alaska is also geographic. I think we're going to have communities uh, uh, that are going to recover much, much faster than others. And again, it's the question of relative exposure to uh, 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 sectors that are sensitive to the pandemic. And so economies that have high dependence on tourism uh, are obviously ones that are not just losing tourism jobs, uh, but they're losing sales taxes and bet taxes. And, and those ripple effects about what local governments are gonna do is one of those hidden little secrets right now. Many of you obviously are familiar with this, um, at least at the state level uh, that has not received as much attention as it should, um, because that's the next round of pressure. Right. And so uh, uh, local governments and what they're going to have to do in order to deal with the massive decline in uh, 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 in, in revenues. So uh, I'll just show you this and then I'll jump to the budget. So this is how I see things going. Uh, I'll, I'll caveat it by saying I have in my forecast continued federal aid. I have normalization of travel by 2021 and I have stable oil prices. I used a forecast of oil prices from the Department of Revenue. I have essentially a, a normalization or return to travel uh, uh, by 2021. Uh, and I have a fairly robust uh, uh, secondary federal aid package. And even with all of that, I have the Alaska economy essentially still being at about 95% of its pre-pandemic levels um, by the end of 2022. Uh, uh, the, the caveat here is that there are more headwinds than there are tailwinds. Uh, clearly, uh, 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 if we don't get the federal aid package, if we don't actually have a rollout of the vaccine that's as optimistic as we've uh, 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 understood over the last few weeks, if people are very, very hesitant when it comes to travel, um, uh, the, the situation could potentially uh, uh, become a little bit trickier. Uh, so, so yes, the economy is going to improve. Uh, yes, next year's numbers are going to look good. Uh, I'm fairly confident uh, that next year we're going to be talking about growth, but we're going to be talking about growth that's coming from a much lower base. There is a so, question. Yes, Doc. Uh, Rip LeBon, do you have a question? Yes, thank you, Jomo. And, and uh, interesting numbers about 25,000 fewer jobs uh, by year end 2020, how does that translate to population numbers or can you project out, are, are folks going to leave the state uh, or are they going to uh, hunker down and stick it out and wait for these jobs to return if these jobs are not returning for several more years? Thank you. Yeah, 
that that's that's a good question. So we we've lost population over the last two years, two or three years, right? So we 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 felt the effect of the the long oil driven recession already, and we've lost population. Uh, my the way I've been thinking about population is is maybe uh, not as intuitive as as some of you may be thinking about it, but. I, I think about relative opportunity, right? And so uh, the Alaska population responds to how well we're doing relative to how well the rest of the US is doing, right? And so right now we are in this kind of common pandemic uh, disaster, which means that there isn't a big differentiating factor between the Alaska economy and the rest of the country. So let's think about oil and gas, for example. The oil and gas sector as a whole is struggling. So job losses in oil and gas are uh, being felt across the country. So somebody that's lost a job in Alaska moving to Houston doesn't do them any favors, right? And so because uh, at least the, from, from that particular sector, there is pain all around. Uh, I'll, tell, I'll give you anecdotal data. The housing sector has been holding up much, much better than I would have expected. So that's potentially telling us that people are hunkering down, at least for the time being. Now, that may be because no state has been the outlier or there aren't hundreds of thousands of jobs that are being created anywhere else. As there is this divergence in return to normalcy, uh, I think we will see out migration, meaning I think that there are states that are much better slated to recover than Alaska because of their industrial composition because of the types of jobs that they will have. As we will see a divergence, I think we will see a response in terms of people following jobs. Uh, it's very hard to imagine uh, that people are gonna wait out jobs in Alaska if uh, uh, half the country is growing at a much faster rate. So, so it's, it's a, a two-part a two answer. Uh, we have not seen massive waves in out migration yet because nobody's doing anything right now. So, so people are hunkered down and we haven't really seen, and we don't have great data. Um, if uh, 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 the, the, the recovery in Alaska mirrors that in other places, uh, that will result in a muted out migration response. If however, as I expect, there are gonna be states that are gonna outperform Alaska then we're clearly going to see movement towards those places. And so uh, I guess the, the thing that we can do is make Alaska as attractive as possible, i.e. implement policies that speed up this recovery as much as possible in order to dissuade this out-migration that potentially happens. Uh, or this, that may potentially dovetail, this may dovetail. Uh, there's a question in the chat box. Uh, it may dovetail with, with this immediate discussion. Yeah, if the budget... If the budget is slashed beyond uh, what the governor proposed, would that 95% recovery by 2022 be set back or accelerated? Or no? Yeah, so, so, so I, have, I have stable budget in my forecast. So this is a forecast that I built originally in, in 2020, in, in, I was gonna say in 2025, in July. Uh, and, so, and so I have essentially a flat budget. So, so anything, uh, that puts downward pressure on government spending or government jobs clearly is going to be a headwind or is going to exacerbate the job losses, right? So the economy does not discriminate. It doesn't care whether a job loss is government or private, right? A job loss is a job loss, and there are multiplier effects from all job losses. And so if we do see austerity measures or we see significant budget cuts, there is no doubt that that's going to reverberate through the rest of, of the economy. And so, uh, I, I mean, the, the, the governor's budget, as I read it and as I understand it, does not seem to have uh, budget cuts. I know that there is that $300 million, but I, I can't as of yet understand where those cuts are coming from. So it said efficiencies, and I, I don't quite understand how that potentially translates to job losses or how quickly those job losses may materialize. Um, and, so, and so, yes, if there are cuts, there is no doubt that that complicates the picture. And so that's what I was hinting at earlier. The local government picture is the one that worries me the most. Uh, uh, it's because, again, we, we have these communities that rely on a mixture of state aid and some sales taxes, some bad taxes. 
and we've had this devastation in those local revenues. Um, so how that will potentially result in layoff across the country, local government layoffs are, 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 are picking up very, very fast. I, we, we don't have great data yet for Alaska, and I'm curious to see how well they're able to absorb some of these decline in, in local government cuts. But there is no doubt right now is, again, I come back to the catalyst, right? And so uh, what's, the, what's the portion of the economy that can spend money? And, and fortunately right now, uh, uh, the government is the, the one, I don't want to call it bright spot, but it's the one place that has quote unquote flexibility to spend money. Um, there's a question about how, do I have a breakdown between how, uh, do I have a breakdown on how those 25,000 jobs lost are split between residents or non-residents? So, so my forecast uses the same data that I described a second ago, which includes both residents and non-residents. Uh, again, you can potentially, if you wanna triangulate, go back, because the forecast is done at the sectoral level, if uh, the job cuts reflect the actual resident to non-resident ratio in the sectors, then you can think about it as being 70-30, meaning 70% of the labor force is probably resident and, and the rest non-resident. Uh, but, but, but I'm not privy to how the layoffs are materializing, right? And so, and, and the reason I'm hesitating is because for example, a lot of the jobs that would have gotten created over the summer in tourism, in leisure and hospitality didn't. And a lot of those jobs are very, very heavily non-resident, right? And so, but, but those are not jobs that were quote unquote lost. Those are jobs that never got created. Uh, meaning that those are typically summer specific jobs that just did not get created. So let me jump to the, uh, to the budget. Yeah, my only comment regarding the budget is I did see that uh, the governor proposes following through another $20 million cut to the university. Yeah. And of course, we're- Well, I mean, the, so the university has signed that compact <laughs> right. with, with the governor. Um, and so uh, uh, at least what I've read is that he's going to uh, uh, go by the compact that was signed, uh, what, a year, a year ago, uh, which has within it fairly significant cuts. Um, but uh, I, I, in, in my forecast, that's not to say that, that this, that's not going to affect the economy. In my forecast, that's baked in because okay. that's, that's reflected in, in last year's budget, right? And so uh, okay. I, I have the agreement as essentially being reflected in last year's. Uh, okay. So um, you all know this, and I'll, and I'll show it to you, and I promise I'll jump to the budget. But, but this is the thing that always, always gets asked about. And this is the reason why Alaska suffered so much. So this is seasonality. This is jobs in uh, Alaska and the rest of the country. The rest of the country are the gray lines in July relative to January. So look at Alaska. Alaska is the orange line. In July, we have typically 15% more jobs than we do in January. And look at the rest of the country. So I don't know how well you can see the gray lines. So even though there are some states that have some semblance of seasonality, it's much more muted than Alaska does. And that's why, because we did not have this bump in economic activity at all, uh, that the situation looks uh, uh, much more complicated for us. So I'm going to skip to... Uh... So uh, this is, so, uh, this is going to be a mixture of uh, the budget and the, uh, the revenue forecast that Department of Revenue just put out three or four days ago. Um, there are no big surprises. Uh, the, the horizontal line here is the FY 2022 budget uh, 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 without the PFD. Uh, so without the PFD, is it's $4.1 billion. Uh, this uh, uh, the, the bars show you uh, uh, revenues that have uh, uh, essentially uh, the permanent fund draw, uh, revenues from petroleum, and revenues from all other sources. And so the, the bars are, again, all the permanent fund draw, 
uh, uh, all petroleum revenues and all uh, 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 other sources. So really, if you look at this and you say, I don't know what the fuss is about, the economy is doing just fine or the budget is just fine, uh, the bars are, are well above uh, 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 the, the, the bars or in 2022, we're basically uh, right aligned or the budget is aligned with uh, uh, the revenues. Again, as I've said, the big caveat here is uh, this has no PFD whatsoever, meaning it's taking the, the POMV and it's dumping it into uh, 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 the budget. And as you can see, if you ignore uh, uh, the, the, the PFD, uh, the revenues uh, uh, are gonna exceed uh, the, the FY 2022 spending levels. So this is obviously making the quote unquote assumption that the budget is gonna stay flat and it's gonna stay flat here in nominal terms, which means it's actually decreasing in real terms. But, but I think that this gives you a sense of what we're actually looking at, right? And so uh, uh, overall revenues are, are now, uh, do you, do you, do you, do you, do you you, no, so so uh, the question is, do my UGF numbers include the governor's undefined $1 billion plus in new revenues, taxes, beginning FY22? No, this is, uh, so, so these are not my numbers. This is the Department of Revenue's 10-year uh, forecast. So, so I'm using uh, uh, DOR's numbers. So clearly, if we do get uh, an additional $1 billion, you have to tack it on, to, on top of this. So, so the composition of these numbers, and I'll show you uh, uh, a decomposition here in a second, they have three categories, POMV, full POMV, meaning 100% of the POMV, uh, petroleum revenues, and then everything else. But, but everything else that does not include any new uh, uh, revenues. So, <laughs> Uh, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this picture here in a second. So this is the, the composition of those numbers. So the, the thing that's most important, and I think everybody knows already, is uh, uh, we used to say that Alaska is an oil state or that the, the, the budget is very, very heavily dependent on oil revenues. Uh, 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 Alaska is still an oil state. The budget is much less dependent on oil revenues than it used to be because of SB 26, the permanent fund draw as a share of overall revenues, again, before dispersing any PFDs, is now almost 70%. So, so between 05 and 14, 90% of UGF was coming from oil revenues. Uh, uh, since the, the passage of SB 26, uh, the, 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 the majority of revenues are now coming from the permanent fund. So you can think about the budget as uh, more dependent on a, uh, on a financial asset uh, than on oil revenues. Uh, and again, this is, uh, I'm not doing anything to these numbers. This is directly from the Department of Revenue. So the question that was being asked about what happens to revenues if there is more taxes or if there are more revenues. So you would need to add a bar <laughs> for uh, that other revenue essentially. Um, and so, uh, well, actually, go back one second, sir, sure. if you don't mind. Yeah, we're definitely going to, me and some others are going to have to dig into that orange bar. That's that's quite a precipitous drop and a stabilization at, a, at almost half of what the revenues had been from petroleum in 2000. Well, I mean, that's what they, that's what they already were here, right? So these, right. these are real numbers. So this is, this is fiscal years, right? Ah, uh, okay. So th these are real numbers. That's right. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so, so, so uh, remember that we had that drop in prices, right? And so, uh, uh, so we, we're, we're already in this territory. Right, okay, thank you, sir. So, and, and, and just to be clear, and, and I'm, I, I don't have time to get into this, but prices, they're, they're assuming prices to basically stay around that $45 mark. Okay. Right, and so, and so, because they, they have a price forecast as well. So, so prices are going to hover around that forty to fifty dollar mark. Clearly, if we do see a, a significant increase in prices, that's going to be reflected in uh, uh, in the orange bar. Got it. Thank you, sir. Yeah, 
and and so and so this is where the, the question becomes uh, 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 tricky, and this is where preferences for how uh, money is allocated uh, complicates matters, and why the state's been running a deficit for multiple years. Uh, one of the things that, that that came out was this idea of what if we allocate 50% of the permanent fund draw towards the dividend? Uh, if that's the case, this is what UGF looks like. So orange line, so if we take the permanent fund draw and say, uh, before any money gets deposited into uh, 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 the government coffers, 50% of that is gonna go towards the dividend, then you're left with 50% of uh, 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 the PF, you're left with petroleum revenues, and you're left with other sources. And that's the orange line, right? Uh, the green line is the revenues that I showed you a second ago. And the, the horizontal line is the FY 2022 proposed budget. And so what you can see is if you, so you take current revenues or current forecasted revenues, and you take uh, uh, the governor's potential shift in allocating the permanent fund starting in FY 2023. And you can see that if we do go through with this 50-50 uh, uh, allocation, then this gap emerges, right? And so that's essentially your deficit going forward. So, so if we do indeed have a billion dollar in new revenues, then it should uh, uh, cover this new allocation with no problem. Uh, if, however, there are no new revenues and current spending levels remain as they are, then this is the deficit that we would be looking at. So, so again, just to be clear, if you take the current POMV and dump it all in the government coffers and then add to it petroleum revenues and add to it all other revenues, you end up with the green bars. That's the difference between FY 2022 spending levels and revenues if you dumped all of the, the, the POMV into the government coffers. And then the orange lines say, let's take only 50% of the POMV, dump it into the government coffers, give out 50% in dividends. This is the deficit that you would be looking at if spending levels stay at the FY 2022 levels which given the, the rate at which healthcare is increasing and a lot of portions of the budgets are, are, the budget are increasing is probably unrealistic. But, but this gives you a sense, so the orange lines give you a sense of how much the state potentially would have to raise uh, through new revenues if it wants this new allocation to be the way uh, forward. I don't know, does that make sense? It does to me, but I'll open it up for questions. Okay. Okay, no one's chiming in. Okay, when, and, and this, is, this is what I mentioned earlier. I think that this is, when I, I created the, the original version of this graph a little while ago, and I think it's the most striking in terms of the, the change in uh, dependence, uh, if you will, uh, on different sources. Uh, and so uh, this is, again, uh, pre-PFD distributions. This is taking the UGF as a whole and dividing it into three components. Uh, 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 permanent fund, uh, petroleum, and then and then everything else. And as you can see, uh, the permanent fund share basically hovers around that 65 to 70 percent uh, going forward. Uh, clearly, if you were to only get uh, 50 percent of the permanent fund in government, then then that share would would change. But this is what the budget looks like right now. Um, it basically uh, is much more heavily dependent on, on the permanent fund. Uh, now, clearly the permanent fund has, has performed remarkably well and has hit $70 billion. And uh, uh, the performance of the stock market has resulted in, in very big gains. I, I'm not privy to what they're gonna realize or how many of those gains are gonna become uh, available for, for spending or how many of them are gonna make it to the earnings reserve. Uh, but that's what the picture looks like right now. Um, the governor essentially proposes a quote-unquote overspending or going above the POMV in order to pay for uh, uh, the statutory dividend, uh, do a payback for this year, um, 
which means uh, uh, paying the statutory dividend requires uh, an additional. So, so the way I interpret uh, I interpreted the budget was we're essentially taking all of the POMV for government right now for FY 2022, and what we're doing is we're drawing above the POMV uh, for the statutory dividend. And uh, on top of that, we're drawing enough money to pay uh, that $1,900 uh, difference between how much the PFDs were and how much they would have been uh, 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 under the statutory formula. So the, the overdraw or the draw beyond the POMV is, uh, is a, a dividend specific draw that's about three some billion dollars or more than three billion dollars. Uh, that's that's uh, uh, above and beyond uh, uh, the POMV. Uh, so, so one may look at it and say, look, the permanent fund's done remarkably well, so it doesn't matter. Uh, you can say, look, the economy is struggling and so we absolutely need to overspend. Uh, how we do that is the big question mark. I, I think it's partially about economics, partially about preferences. Uh, um, the economy does need support. Uh, are the dividends the most targeted version of providing that support? Probably not, uh, but they're probably the quickest way to get money in people's pockets. And so, um, yeah, so I, I, I think that that's uh, all I, I have. Um, so yeah, I, I think that uh, again, we've reached bottom. I, I, I'm fairly confident that that's the case uh, I, I think, again, uh, I didn't speak a lot about this, but I think virus containment uh, simplifies the recovery quite a bit and gets us back to, to normal spending behaviors, normal economic activity uh, 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 much faster than anything else. Um, I think that uh, uh, the, the thing that doesn't get enough attention, I'm a regional economist by training, and so I think about place a lot, I think about industrial composition a lot, is that this is not gonna be an even recovery across the state. Um, and I think that if there are scarce dollars and we're trying to figure out how to spend them, uh, then we need to think about which places, which industries are most affected. How do we mitigate business failures? How do we uh, potentially uh, uh, minimize uh, uh, damage uh, that can have uh, long-term negative consequences? Because uh, I, I don't think about any of this as stimulus. I think about it as stabilization. Um, again, in order to get to a place where organic catalysts can get us uh, uh, to move forward. It's just that right now, um, and I'll just I'll leave you with this. This is what the employment picture looks like now uh, at the state level. Uh, this is year over year number. So every sector relative to the same month last year. Uh, so it's a sea of red. Red is not good. Um, the, the only thing that was green for a couple of months was the federal government. Um, and it was green because of the census. Uh, uh, th there, are, there are some improvements, healthcare, education, and healthcare is mainly healthcare. We're basically back to pre-pandemic levels, which means that there was a lot of pent up demand. Uh, there was very significant decline in employment in the sector uh, when we had those closures and people couldn't go get procedures. Uh, we're now back to basically pre-pandemic levels. Uh, leisure and hospitality is still struggling. Uh, mining and logging, which is basically uh, uh, oil and gas, is really struggling. Uh, um, so that's where we are. Like I said, I have big question marks about local government, uh, about whether or not some of the losses are being delayed. Um, and, and this sector is uh, notoriously difficult to kind of get a gauge on because it has uh, school teachers within it. And so it's tough to know uh, what, what's going on in, in the sector. And then constructions performed better than I would have expected because we had quite a few projects come back online once we had the reopening, if you will. Um, and so uh, that's, that's what the challenge is. So this is what the economy looks like, right? So these are real numbers. This is not, this is not even, uh, 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 this is without me interpreting them, this is what it looks like. So the question is, uh, how do we get back into the green and how fast and uh, uh, what, are, what are the organic drivers? What are the things that we can do in order to speed up or stabilize uh, sectors that are that are struggling, and clearly the 
the budget or spending uh, is part of this conversation. There was obviously the, the, the talk about a, a bond in order to get economic activity back up. Uh, uh, that get, getting economic activity back up is obviously something that needs to happen. I don't know how quickly it can happen through that mechanism specifically. Um, but uh, uh, again, these are questions that are, uh, I think, uh, about preferences as opposed to economics. So I'll stop. Okay. And, and feel, I'll, I'll give Jomo the presentation, but feel free to reach out if I got something wrong or if you want to tell me I'm an idiot or something, feel free to do that. Well, Dr. Katabi, thank you so much. Um, we Sorry for have, going long. I just, no, uh, no. I, I, I knew you'd be thorough, um, and I was I was hoping you would be. Um, I would like to uh, give, uh, particularly the policymakers, a, a chance to ask any questions or, or weigh in in any way they might like, uh, while we still have the benefit of your time. Rep. Lebomb. Well, thank oh, you, Chomo. I, I I guess uh, it would be first of all a thank you to Dr. Gutabi for spending an extra amount of time here with us this morning. And uh, I think he's framed the challenge uh, very well. Uh, how do we increase demand for economic activity to get people back to work, to um, tourism? How do we get uh, folks visiting Alaska again? And that's, that's such an important factor in the hospitality industry and, and our challenges are big and balancing those challenges against overdrawing the earnings reserve account. Uh, what a decision for uh, policymakers here in the next session. And I guess that's more comment than question, but uh, I, th I thought he framed it very well. And thank you for joining us this morning. Okay. All right. Well, again, anyone else? Mr. Mr. Hardenbrook. Okay. Well, again, Doc, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. I will say that we, uh, we at FEDC, we we've been wrestling with the. Is it okay to draw more on the permanent fund, um, just as a, a high level?